How did we end up here? In this dump? You were a movie star, remember? Welcome to Editors on Editing. I'm your host, Glenn Garland. Stephen Maroney has edited such exceptional films as Traffic, for which he won the Oscar, Babel, for which he and Doug Kreiss were nominated for the Oscar and BAFTA, winning the Eddie Award, Good Night and Good Luck, for which he was nominated for the BAFTA and Eddie Award, August Assange County, for which he was nominated for the Eddie, 21 Grams, for which he was nominated for the BAFTA, as well as Ocean's Eleven and The Hunger Games. In addition to Babel, Doug Kreis has edited such excellent films as Kill the Irishman, Arbitrage, Spring Breakers, and Cesar Chavez. Together they have crafted the groundbreaking film, Birdman. Doug, Stephen, thank you so much for being here. I was just blown away, it left me speechless at the end. I was just, I didn't know what to say to my wife. I was just <laughs> like, wow, that was incredible. Mm -hmm. Because there's not many visible edits in the movie, how did you guys work? Was it something where Alejandro had you involved in pre-production, helping map out the shots, or how did that all work out? When Alejandro told me about the, this movie um, and told me how he wanted to do it, first thing I thought of was, well, the only way he's gonna pull that off is there's gonna be, have to be a lot of rehearsals. And he's like, oh yeah, we're, we're gonna be doing them with real cameras, we'll be doing that. So I can, I said, but you should also give that to me so that mm. I can start cutting so that some of these decisions that you would normally make after the fact, um, you can start to get a sense of that and, and start to make adjustments and maybe you decide you wanna you know, rewrite a scene based on seeing it all together. Mm. So by the time Doug started, which is when they started shooting, um, we actually had a, a pretty uh, complete assembly of the whole movie that Alejandro um, was able to already reference. With the uh, actors or with? Some with actors, some with, uh, with stand-ins. Uh, stand yeah, and some of, you know, some of it in the real locations, some of it in like a, a sound stage with just taped off marks. And as they started shooting, Doug would be sending me his cuts and I would be able to watch them in the context of kind of flipping back and forth between rehearsals and the actual shots, um, which was a really fascinating way to watch the movie, actually. How did that help the process, looking at the rehearsals against the, the actual shots? Well, there was a lot of uh, predetermined places where they would know to start and stop the sh cuts. They figured that out all ahead of time. And within those takes, those start and stops, then they would also know that there'd be places we could always make an edit if we had to. But I, I think that's where the, the biggest decisions were made. And it also probably had a lot to do with figuring out like the visual effects and stuff that they were gonna have to do. With this, we had to know um, you know, on the day, does this shot make sense in the course of the entire movie. So would you look at a rehearsal and then recommend to Alejandro, you know, we might need to pace it up here, we might need to come around so that we see this other person's reaction, because reactions are such a huge tool, you know, in the toolbox of an editor. Mm -hmm. And here, some of the reactions were in mirrors. Yeah, exactly. Like, you really, as an editor, take for granted how much you are making the, the, the initial decisions of who are you looking at at any given point in a scene. And this, we've completely given up that control to Alejandro and, and the DP, Chivo. The dance that, that they're making is the dance that we have to commit to. He would shoot alternates of things. He would shoot the scene with, with someone entering the room or not entering the room. So he had that option. There was a situation uh, where he had shot the scene and I, I saw it and said to him, well, I would like to maybe be on Michael here. And he called me, by the way, yeah, after, yeah. after that conversation, yeah. he called me and said, does, D Doug does understand there are no going to be cuts in this movie, right? <laughs> 
And yeah. I'm like, oh, you know, he understands it. I yeah. think he was just, I was just reacting. He was just reacting to, hi, yeah. I would have been, and so he took it seriously. Yeah, and yeah he reshot the scene two days later. You realize how easy you have it when you can make adjustments to pace just by, you know, the things that you do unconsciously as an editor, um, when you're cutting between two characters and you're just kind of snipping away to, to tighten up the, the, the interplay of the dialogue. This had to be figured out. Ahead so, of time. with the pace, did you ever do speed ramps or repositions within shots or anything to help? Yeah, we definitely did a lot of those type of things when we felt necessary. A lot of adjusting the speeds. There was even times we decided we need to slow it down a little bit. Mm. You can make changes, but it's in a very narrow range, and so at that point, you're just you're really uh, massaging things. And then we're. Any of those shots ever sewn together in like the middle? If there was like something where it's like this performance is just too precious. You know, early on, I told Alejandro, "Listen, this is what I can do with this take. I can I can mix this with this with this with this." And he looked at that and was really clear about, "I don't want to start thinking about these takes as interchangeable or trying to find ways to to mix this." You and want that. to have the courage to go for it. Exactly, because I think that kind of net would have it would have changed the energy on the day that they were shooting. It would have changed his level of when do I know I'm done? Because he might have in his head started t telling himself, okay, this take is pretty good and this take is pretty good. As long as I can put them together, then I'm done for the day. But he didn't want to be thinking that way. He really wanted to make sure that if he absolutely had to, this one take ends up in the movie and that's what it is and I'll and I'm proud of it and it it does everything I want it to do mm -hmm. and I think that also gave a lot of confidence then to the actors you're doing this because you're scared to death like the rest of us that you don't matter and you know what you're right you don't it's not important okay you're not important get used to it their rhythm and everything that they were doing was not going to get manipulated it infused everything sure. i think and and so yeah then after the it's fact it's like walking a tightrope yeah. exactly and there's that energy of knowing if one of these if i screw one of these up and i don't realize it until we're in post production and i don't have money to go back and reshoot a day or something which they you know they really didn't then the whole movie is ruined you know? wow and how many takes would he shoot in general a lot <laughs> their day was one big section of the film that they would shoot and they would shoot this you know this big long take and they would they would rehearse it all morning long and then they would go into shooting it and they would shoot whatever they could get for the day. Some days it'd be 30, some days it'd be, you know, less, depending on what they could cover in that day. But so then after that day, then you would go about choosing the best take or what, was yeah, he, it sort of decided on set? It was a combination, yeah. I'd say. I mean, he, he knew he knew what his favorites were. Yeah, and he, then he, he had his circled ones and then he, yeah. had, he, had, he had other ones he would say, you know, and then he would say, you know, is there... Is there a place where we can combine these two if we if we have to? But he did have that he did have that definite feeling where, like Stephen said, that he uh, wanted to be able to know that he had one good one because he is not a person that compromises easily. When you did do cuts, was it usually like in a whip pan or when it went into the shadows or? We've already dug you. You've already like talked way too much about what, like that's the kind of thing that Alejandro is. Don't give up the mystery. Well, it's not even just that. It's funny that this is one, this is probably one of the first movies I've worked on where people actually want to mm -hmm. talk about the, the editing. So, you know, we don't want to really get into um, exactly how many cuts there were, mm -hmm. exactly how we did it. Um, sure. That to me is the magic of of what Alejandro did with this movie. It's it's well, you, know, you start forgetting that there are no edits. I mean, at first, I I started to go wait there's no edits in this movie. And, and you pay attention to that for a little bit, but then you forget about it because the performances are so rich and you're not anxious to see, well, why am I not seeing that other character? Right. It's so well choreographed. Right. So that then when you have some edits with the montage at the end, sure. it, it assaults you because you, you've you got been lulled into this world where you don't need to. Absolutely. Well, when I was working with Alejandro, it was like, I think he had about a week or two weeks left of shooting. He says, I want to see the whole movie. And I'm like, okay, and he, so I, I, I gave him what we had. Of course, we were still missing a chunk. And he watched it, and he says this movie's like a toboggan ride. You don't stop. He says you have that normal sense in a film where scenes start and stop all the mm. time. 
And he said, but this film, you constantly have this movement, this movement from one scene into the next, and it never, it never gives you that break to realize or catch your breath. And it was what I find amazing is he actually built those moments into the movie in several spots that are just genius, that, where it's, okay, now it's time to stop for a second when Zach Galifianakis is walking down the hallway and we're going to meet Mike Shiner for the first time. There's like a little break in the action. The, the dialogue slows down. The, the classic one is after the performance where Michael Keaton comes in in his underwear, camera follows Jake up the steps, and, and then we just hit, look at that empty hallway. And, and when, when we were doing that and timing that out and how long that would be, I kept thinking, this is such a long moment. Why is this so long? I'm going to speed this up. And, 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 but it, was, it gave such a great pause to the whole moment that it just, it's like one of my favorite moments in the movie. Alejandro is such a, is such a master of this that he really knew ahead of time, these are the spots where I think I'm going to need that breath. I'm going to need that so space all thought out for the audience to, 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 to digest. And so structurally, he already had those moments figured out. And he designed them in a way that once they were done, we could actually, you know, uh, tune them to be exactly the, the length they needed to be. And, and again, it's one of those things that if he had miscalculated, you know, uh, it, would have been, it would have been a mess. I mean, I, I look at it like... Uh, you know, they talk about someone like Mozart, you know, ha hearing the entire symphony in his head before he starts writing it down. That's, to me, what Alejandro was doing with this, in a sense. That's, mm -hmm. that's how amazing it really was. Well, really it's quite amazing Sasha. also to know that the timing has to be this for, like, with the background plates of the flying, for instance, the complexity right. of well, trying to, to make sure that they'll match. Right. That was one of my favorite moments was seeing that. I just thought it was just perfect. It just, it, it happened at exactly the right point in the movie, this, this ecstasy. <laughs> And that was him as Birdman, right? That yes. wasn't yes. another actor. Correct. Because they de-aged him. Sure, it almost sure. seemed like, is that somebody else in that outfit? But right. that's well, his voice. Well, because they shoot everything practically, they had, you know, for some of that, they had a stand-in to walk behind Michael when they're walking down the street and doing the acting. He has an earwig in his ear so he can be feeding off of someone and Alejandro hires a real actor to give him those moments so he's not just having the script supervisor read lines to him so that he can have something he can really play off of. So there was an actor behind him when he's levitating at the beginning oh, yeah. and things yeah. like that and that way they knew how to pace it out. Exactly. Right. Wow. And was Keaton's voice manipulated later or or was that That's how did he, he, he did it. He did it. And it was tough. I remember he um it was a tough, it's a tough way to talk because he would really throw out his voice um, at the end of a, of a couple of takes of doing that. So, you know, we'd have to spread him out coming back to do that over the uh, course of many days. We'll make a comeback. Shave off that pathetic goatee. Get some and what was the decision, like, at the beginning you have this, like, flash cut to the beach and then the comet and then we go into Rigman's world. What was the decision to put those up there to sort of prepare the audience? Uh, to me, this movie is uh, is Riggin's point of view. So those so, were almost images inside Riggin's mind. Yes, and so that's that's like uh, it's it's just a way to frame a before and after. Were they always planned to be there, or was that something yes. that was decided? Yeah, no, that was part of the structure and part of part of the script, and exactly what those shots were. The, those were figured out as we went as we went along. But. In fact, I was so shocked when I saw those shots of this marching band on Times Square. And Alejandro says to John, you've got to get that, me that band. Alejandro pulled that band up onto the theater and put them on stage and started shooting these shots. And I got these shots, and you know, at this point, I know how the movie's going to be cut together. <laughs> I'm like, where are these going? And tell me about the transitions from day to night. If you if you'd like to, uh, so was it like when it went to the sky? Did the camera lock down and shoot like a time lapse and then come back down, or I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. He's... <laughs> okay, that's a very specific detail. Okay, <laughs> the performances are so good with the mirror shots. Did you ever have other actors uh, like from other takes in the mirrors? No, that that was all planned out. So if, if you see a performance in a mirror, that's the, that's how that's they the did same it. take. That's how they did it. And, and so again, any, any one of the takes in the movie could have been 
that's just how they shot it on the day. One of the most incredible scenes was when he's talking to the theater critic. None of this costs you anything. The performances are just so powerful. You don't get to come in here and pretend you can write, direct, and act in your own propaganda piece without coming through me first. Well, Alejandro tells me that that's his favorite moment in the film, too, because he says to me what he really loves about this scene is they're both very vicious to each other, but they're both speaking the truth. Ne neither one of them is being dishonest, and, the, and that's what he loves about that argument. The music with uh, the jazz, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it's such an integral part of the film that it's almost like that Kramer versus Kramer where you see guys on the street become mm -hmm. the, the score. Again, this is Alejandro seeing the whole movie in his head ahead of time. I mean, it's it's uh, he performed with Antonio and did recorded a bunch of jazz tracks before we ever started shooting the film. I was delivered those jazz tracks like my first day of cutting. That was all a planned out thing. That was a part of the figuring out the pacing of the film and giving the, the, the film a rhythm. I was a little tentative on trying it out and putting it in the scenes because there was so much dialogue and stuff and Alejandro kept pushing me. You have to, you know, get more drum stuff into the film. You have to keep the rhythm. You have to, you know, make it work. The one thing about the, the score as well, um, we take for granted that every time you're cutting in a movie, you're, you're creating this rhythm and you're, you can make that rhythm, you can increase that rhythm or slow it down, and you, you have a lot of impact on how an audience is connecting with a scene. This is going to be a tool that we can use to recreate what we've now lost by not having any cuts, not having any edits. We can use that music to fill in for that kind of, uh, I want to get the audience. Well, it, it makes you feel very anxious, that, that jazz. It, because sometimes it's, it does. Because and it's a little bit discordant. You know? True, but sometimes it's, it's working to slow things down and to mellow you out. And again, it's an unconscious thing that a lot of times when you're watching a movie with cutting, you're not aware of it. When I first saw the movie all the way through, I had the experience of feeling like I had dreamed it. There was something that I realized that, that when you're watching a movie that has cuts, for me, it gives you a chance to let your brain organize mm -hmm. what you've seen. And with this, I, I just, it's like, I couldn't, I started to feel almost hypnotized. Like, that's what Alejandro wanted to create. But the fact that, that it actually got created in that way, I think... Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of this, you're not sure if, if it's real or if it's in his mind, but then there's that one time where, after the flying sequence, you see the cab, and you're like... Of and the cat, Or course. the time that he's destroying his and, room, and he's doing it all through again, levitation, but then they come in and he's got I, something I find in his that, I find that bizarre when I read what people say about the film, that they don't know if he's really levitating or not levitating, where to me it was completely clear it's that like, he does isn't. He have, does he really have superpowers? Yeah. Did he really fly or did he take a cab? It doesn't matter because he believes both. You are a god. Hey, is this for real or are you shooting a film? A film! With Alejandro, his ability to collaborate and to, to pull great performances, not just out of the actors, but out of the entire creative um, crew, um, he, he's just second to none. Yeah. He's and really, he, really good at it. And he definitely pushed me to do things yeah. that I didn't think that I would even think of doing. I mean, it was, it was a matter of, you know, because you're used to, be, like you say over and over, you're used to being able to cut away or cut, cut to this next thing or do the, or find different ways. And they'd be like, no, no, this is what we're going to do and this is how it's going to be done. Can you find ways to make this better? Right. Can you find ways to wow. change the pace on this? Right. Can you find a better audio performance? Can you try this? The tricks you do all the time, but it becomes... But you were locked in. You locked right? in and you have to do it this way. And, and he's you, still saying to you, like normally he'd come in and say... The emotions, I want to tweak it like, I want to dial yeah. it a little bit like this. Okay, well, normally you've got all of the material to go away and do yeah. that. It's like putting a hand behind your back and saying, okay, now, now do it. And so, yeah. you know, we had, to, we had to find new ways to do with that. And it's not like he just said, okay, do exactly this, this, or this. He still was doing that normal, yeah. that great, where he would say, I want to feel this. Well, I just found the movie to be a tour de force, and I just enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. And Thank you sure. so much for, for yeah. talking to me. Sure thing. Thank you. Hey, come on. Don't get, let me get an autograph. Dude, you freaking rock!